So anyway, but we want to talk specifically about a very pervasive and very, uh, it's a type of leavening actually that's often hidden and uh, often, you know, not easy to detect even that might be in our own lives if we are not uh, diligent to try to seek it out. And that is the leavening of pride. The leaven of pride. And as you can see, um, the, the leaven in bread causes the bread to puff up, doesn't it? And that's a big old loaf of bread. And it's uh, very tall and puffed up. And um, pride, that's what pride's all about. Um, puffing yourself up and uh, trying to make yourself something that you're not. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's it. We need to remember the importance of getting this particular leavening out of our lives. And uh, one might say that pride is uh, the main uh, thing that a lot of other sins are rooted in. And uh, we're going to be going into that. As we as we progress through the scriptures in today's study, um, a lot of things are rooted in pride, and so if we can get the pride out, a lot of times we can get the other things that come out of that out as well. So we can get to the root of a lot of sins, and uh, so. You know, maybe we have areas of our life, you know, Yahweh is trying to show us something. He's trying to to um, shine the light on some dark part of our heart. and um, But we're just too proud, you know, to realize it. Or look for it. Or care about it. Or acknowledge it. Um, maybe we're afraid of what Others may say if we have to change this part about us, or maybe there's something in our heart that just doesn't want to do that part of Yahweh's commands, or doesn't bring all good, happy feelings. You know, we got to look at Yahweh's word and say, you know what? It's really not worth it to just ignore that part of His word and. And think I'm going to still make it, and think you know I can live an unrepentant lifestyle, and and uh, and really call myself a repentant believer. We have to be among those who hunger and thirst for what's right. And um, so when we look at Yahweh's word, and it's so easy, isn't it? You know, to to read the scriptures and and say, boy, that scripture there, that really. That really um, hits those other people really hard over there, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know how they can live their life and ignore that one verse right there, buddy. That's uh, they're very wrong for that. Easy to do that, um, but how about ourselves? You know, we, as they say, you got one finger pointing at somebody else. There's three pointing back at you, and uh, and that's true. Um, but you know, it's sometimes it's pride. You know, that compels us to, if we hear other people who are uninformed, you know, give their arguments and their reasonings to, to justify their behavior, we may, you know, listen to it and, and laugh and, and think they're funny and, and how silly they are and uh, how could they possibly think that and yet, you know, Yahweh's in heaven looking at us and, and saying, well, you're no different in this other area over here. You're doing the same thing, and uh, and here you're laughing at others, you know. So there's just all kinds of little nooks and crannies that pride manages to take residence in our hearts, and um, you know there's a danger of denominationalism. Um, you know, people by by nature of the idea of Say, setting up a denomination and saying, come to us, you know, we have all the truth now. We found it. Come to us. We will teach you the right way. And, we, and we've and we learned it. And um, we've, we were here. We've arrived. Um, 
And so we need to go to our church. And if you're not part of our church and you're not part of our congregation, a part of our fellowship, then you're really not his, you know, because his people are supposed to be doing this and you're not doing that. Therefore, you know, it's all pride. It's all pride. And uh, so I say, let's, you know, forget the dominations, forget the organizations, whatever they're doing. They found some truth. Great. But there's more. There's more. There's more truth I know that I have yet to discover, that you have yet to discover, that we need to illuminate, not necessarily and even in doctrine, but just about ourselves. Some truth about ourselves that Yahweh sees that we don't see. Um, and so we want to continually ask Him, what, what areas of my life Yahweh, do you want me to change? What do I need to change? And, and one of the biggest barriers is pride. And uh, it's very rampant, very common sin, uh, also very silent. Uh, it's sometimes uh, very elusive, yeah, elusive, very hidden, but it's almost everywhere a man is, everywhere a carnal man is. And, uh, and so... You know, I want to start off by saying that myself, um, I continually learn, and, and Yahweh shows me often little things I do that are motivated in pride, in pride of life, pride, just overall pride. And uh, so I'm not claiming to have been one who's arrived, even in this area, especially this area. Uh, of overcoming pride, but I'm going to share with you some things that, you know, either something I've noticed and observed uh, through reading a scripture, uh, or something Yahweh shown me in my own walk that, you know, I've had to get purged out. And so, I don't want to teach this message and and you know end up being guilty of you know of hypocrisy, uh, Yahweh looking at me and you know. So I, I'm just saying that. Um, I'm here alongside you as your brother in the faith, and uh, I want to come alongside you and say, look, we all got some overcoming to do, and uh, here's some things that we need to really look at. And uh, so we're going to look at the scriptures and see what we can find in this, because pride sometimes keeps us from seeing our own pride. See? <laughs> it has a way of the, the sin itself conceals the fact that we have the sin. Um, the pride keeps us from recognizing our own. We're too pride, to, too prideful to recognize our own pride, pridefulness. <laughs> and I, I'm not laughing because it's funny, but because it's so just so true that you know that's the nature of it. It's a it's a it's a wild beast that um, has to be whipped out of us. And, um, and it's a sad state to be in. And Scripture says, the heart's desperately wicked. Who can know it? And, um, and whoever follows his own heart is a fool. So be careful about our heart. Don't pride be hidden there. You don't even realize it. And Yahweh hates it. Boy, does he hate pride over and over again. He talks about that. And so he says, If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, put your hand on your mouth. Proverbs 30, verse 32. Wow. Put your hand over your mouth and say, Boy, that was foolish. You ever done that? I, know, I was in first and second grade. All of our school, school kids around us would go, Ah, oh, you know, they did this terrible thing. They saw somebody doing it. They go, ah, oh, you know. And so, if if you've been, as uh, scripture says, if you've been foolish in exalting yourself, put your hand over your mouth. You know, maybe you need to zip it up. <laughs> and um, because that's an awful thing. Yahweh hates it. And um. And so scripture teaches us, and this, this is how it relates to the feast days, and how it relates to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Scripture says, your glorying is not good. 
1 Corinthians 6, 5, verse 6. Glorying in what? In, in sin, even here. In this case, the context. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. You know, has made us unleavened. So let's live our lives as being men who are without leaven. Get that glorying out of you. Quit glorying in your own your own self, your own... And sometimes people even glory in their sin, as they were here in 1 Corinthians 5. Um, for indeed, Messiah, our Passover was sacrificed for us, to make us unleavened, to purge out the old leaven. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. Don't get that old sin out that you used to commit in the old days, before you knew Messiah. Don't get that back out again. Nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread, of sincerity and truth. So uh, that's how we want to keep the feast. Get this leaven out. Purge it out. Get this glorying out, this pride out, and become this new lump the Messiah has created. A new loaf of, uh, of bread that Yahweh wants to create. That's unleavened. So we partook of the unleavened body of the Messiah uh, through the unleavened bread. And that went into our bodies representing the Messiah and his indwelling, the word, which made flesh. It says that the veil, his, his flesh is the veil. The word made flesh that dwelt among us. The word is now within us because Yahshua is resident there. And we have the word there and we have cleansing as we partook of the fruit of the vine the cleanse, cleansing blood of the Messiah is now on the, on the doorposts of our hearts and on the lentils of our of our frame that we have Yahweh's dwelling place he's given us so because that's true let's live like it is since the word since the law of Yahweh is written in the hearts of all of us. That's the new covenant, the cup of the new covenant in his blood. Since that's true, let's live our lives in that manner, that unleavened manner. And that's what we're being admonished to do here in the scriptures. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, talks about the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. It says, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled on one another, trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. That's their leavening. He referred to their leavening as being hypocrisy. Some examples of that in Matthew 23 he says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad. That's the little boxes with scriptures on them that tie to their wrists and so on. And uh, the, enlarge the borders of their garments. That's their tassels. It's one thing to have tassels. Oh, boy, you're going to have the biggest tassel, you know, because you're really going to make sure you follow the commands. Therefore, your, your tassel is going to be bigger than everybody else's. It's like those who got that big old King James Bible, the biggest one you ever saw, you know. Uh, got that under their arm. And, and um, while it collects dust at home, you know, it doesn't ever get rid. It's all for a show. And they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Messiah, and you are all brethren. See, in spite of what's seen in Messianic circles today, brothers, not one of the twelve apostles or any, any man uh, at, that was a follower of the Messiah and part of the Messiah's assembly in the first century, never is there any scripture seen where any of them called themselves rabbi. Not one. Maybe they heeded this word here, not to be called rabbi. And um, do not call anyone on earth your father. Now it's talking about a spiritual father. Like you're the one that begot me. Spiritual One is your father. He who is in heaven. Now do not be called teachers. 
Uh, for one is your teacher, the Messiah. Like, don't ever call me Teacher Elia. <laughs> I might have the gift of teaching. But that doesn't mean you call me your teacher. Yeah, she was your teacher. I just, I'm just letting his word go. That's all. It's it's his word that's teaching you, not me. And um, so I'm illuminating here, shining light on the word. That's all. The messenger. That's all. Carrying a message. So he. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself, himself will be exalted. So here's 11 of the Pharisees. Pride and the hypocrisy. The hypocrisy was rooted in pride. He was, they were interested in what others would say about them and to receive honor from men. But they, they regarded the honor from men to be more important than having the praise of Yahweh. And that's that's a terrible position to be in. And we're told to beware of that leavening. And uh, how many of you have heard that scripture, pride goes before a fall? Actually, that scripture is nowhere in the Bible. Uh, although it's sort of similar. Uh, in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. So, if we're prideful, then we're heading for destruction. If we're hot of a haughty spirit, our spirit is just a little bit arrogant, a little haughty, a little prideful in our spirit, then uh, we may find ourselves in a major fall. There, better to be of humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud proud. So it's sometimes it's the people we hang around. You know, they're all focused on the glory of man, maybe. And um we want to associate with the humble. How the scriptures tell us, associate with the humble. And pride's very deceptive. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 3 says the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock. You know, a sign of a man who is not fallen under deception is a man who's humble. You know, those who are prideful are more likely to find themselves under the cloud of deception if, you're, if they have a pride in the heart. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says Yahweh. Don't they have space stations these days, uh, kind of nesting around the stars? I don't know. But Yahweh has a habit of humbling the proud, doesn't he? It's a good habit, though. It really is. It's a good thing. Because um, we need that. That humbling so that we will draw ourselves near to Yahweh. Yahweh hates the pride. He can't stand He doesn't even, even like it when we have a smug look about our face. You know, a smug look. A prideful look. In, chapter, in Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 16, six things Yahweh hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. It all starts with what? A proud look, doesn't it? This is a picture of one who has yielded their members, parts of their body, to be instruments of unrighteousness. That's what this is. So, you know, we want to be among those who who yield their members to be instruments of righteousness. We have the proud, the face is prideful, the tongue is a lying tongue. The hands are shedding innocent blood. The hearts devising wicked plans. The feet are quick to run to evil. And then they use that tongue to speak these lies and create discord among brothers. People who are at peace. Yahweh hates these things. And it all starts with this pride, prideful 
look, lifted eyes is what the literal phrase there is in Hebrew. Lifted up eyes. He hates that. Why does Yahweh hate pride so much? Well, it's, it's the root of a lot of other sins. And Yahweh knows that. And it deceives us. Sometimes we don't think we have it. Later, we realize we had a prideful motivation somewhere. It's, it's very unusual. It's deceptiveness. It's a state of mind. More so than maybe just some one sin that you created or committed at one time. It's a state of mind. Uh, more so than something you just commit on occasion. And so it's a character. It's a part of a character of a person that we are either humble or we are prideful. And maybe we'll have moments of humility and moments of pride. Um, but if we have a humble state of mind, then pride won't find its way in there. But why does why does Yahweh hate the pride? And what's so bad about it? I mean... Pride can actually drive a man to do a lot of things, even good things. Uh, given to the poor and, and um, you know, oh, look at me, I gave to the poor, you know. Why does Yahweh hate it? Uh, some people say, well, I'm proud to be this, you know. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to do this. I'm proud to be a part of this company or this family or this team or whatever it is. Um, now, there's a... What do we really have to be prideful about? I mean, what do we have to be proud of? I mean, I understand maybe what some people are saying by that phrase is, I'm not ashamed to be a part of this group here. I'm not ashamed to be a part. Of, I'm glad I'm a member of this. I'm, but there's sometimes that crosses over into a worldly pride. And um, really, we have nothing to be proud of, if you really think about it. What... What does man have to be proud? I mean, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, everything he made for them. He gave man everything he has. And yet man, since the beginning of creation, has rebelled against his creator. And, you know, we didn't make ourselves. We can't do a thing apart from Yahweh. Every breath we take, we're borrowing from him. And we can't give it back. We take the oxygen away. We can't give it back. Well, our heart beats by his mercies. And yet all the world acts as though he doesn't exist. Yahweh even sends his own son to die for us on the tree. And many are too pride, prideful to accept him. It's Yahweh who gave us the breath of life. Remember Job. All the awful things that happened to Job. And Job got caught up in pride himself, started justifying himself. Uh, people were accusing him. He started justifying himself and then kind of got caught up in exalting himself a little bit and, um, and, and justifying himself rather than Yahweh. Maybe if Job had said, you know, I don't know what I've done wrong, but I don't really deserve anything. I don't really deserve to not have these boils on my skin. I don't deserve anything I've gotten. But, uh, you know, he started detailing his own righteousness, and he uh, got caught up a little bit. That was one area, the even one that Yahweh bragged about. How about my servant Job, one who fears Elohim, eschews evil? He got caught up in it. And so Yahweh answered Job how the whirlwind. He answered him. And Yahweh spoke to Job, and he said this. He said, Thus Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? You're creating darkness in your counsel, Job. Words with no knowledge. Prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you, and you shall answer me. Since he got questioned. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that. <laughs> how many times I've, I've, uh, I've heard you know, people say this or say that, and I've, that a scripture comes to mind. So, where were you when he laid the foundations of the earth anyway? You know, Yahweh spends the next two chapters declaring his worthiness. 
to know exactly what he's doing. Yahweh knows what he's doing. And our inability to even come close to his might and his power. You know, imagine, just think for a moment, one thing happens which causes another thing to happen, which causes another thing to happen. If one of those things have changed a little bit, this wouldn't happen and that wouldn't happen. And uh, you ever thought back in, in your in your history and just thought, boy, if, if I wouldn't have got this job over here, I would never have met this person who met who introduced me to that person, then I met my wife through that person. If I had never gotten that job, I went to work for someone else, I never would have met my wife, I never would have had these children. You know, Yahweh's got all this stuff in his head. He knows exactly how to plan everything out, just perfect. So, in arranged circumstances, so that we'll maximize our, our life and our, our ability to serve him. Uh, properly and and to be faithful and to reach others with him his Messiah also so we stand back and maybe if we're not careful find ourselves pridefully questioning circumstances and why this happened and why that happened and and Yahweh who hears every prayer of every person uh, you know and hears all and sees everything going on we think he doesn't know what what he's doing I mean he knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> It's we don't know what he's doing, and we have to be humble and recognize he knows exactly how to handle things. And uh, so sometimes, you know, we'll be in the midst of this trial and, you know, going through things. You know what trials are? Trials are opportunities to justify Yahweh rather than yourself. Sometimes people, you know, are not careful. We get caught up in this bad thing happening to us, and we they all think in our hearts, oh, I didn't do anything to deserve this. Yeah, right. Yahshua was sent into the world and to be tortured and killed, and but not you. You deserve better, right? Not. See, Yahweh does not send trials upon us necessarily for our evil. For believers in him, he sends them upon us for our good. And maybe we think, well, this terrible thing happened to us. So how could Yahweh do this to us? Well, how did he do that to his son? His own son, his only begotten son. He had a reason for it. For the greater good. Of the, the big picture good of all the people. And we're called to be walking in his footsteps. That means we may have to suffer some things. We have to let go of some things. And uh, it's for the greater good. And Yahweh understands all the inner workings of why. Um, maybe he sees some area of imperfection. He wants to glorify himself in our weaknesses. You know, but one thing a trial will often do is bring us to a place of humility if we're willing to be humbled by it. And uh, one day, that's going to occur to everyone who's on the face of the earth. For the day of Yahweh of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. See, the day of Yahweh has a whole lot to do with humbling the proud. And so we want to be sure we're not among the ones who need to be humbled at that time, right? We need to be humbled already. Without the need for some kind of trouble or the day of Yahweh to come to put us in our place. Because when the day of Yahweh comes, he will put all things back in its proper perspective. All the mountains will be made low, the valleys will be lifted up, and Yahweh alone will be exalted above all things in that day. But wasn't that the sin that Satan got caught up in? Wasn't it, wasn't it pride? To exalt himself above the, above Yahweh, and, and he's in fact still caught up in it. He's constantly trying to provoke men to get caught up in the same thing and join him in that rebellion. And that rebellion is rooted in pride and not recognizing Yahweh, he's the Elohim, not us. Know that Yahweh, he is Elohim, it is he who made us and not we ourselves. Evolutionists think we've made ourselves. Evolutionists think, oh, our own, we created ourselves out of this uh, primordial soup. 
No, Yahweh says he made us, not we ourselves. Get off your high horse. Quit claiming your own greatness. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. We didn't evolve from some swampy pit. Don't make a monkey out of yourself. <laughs> Living matter cannot come out of dead matter. I don't care how long you stare at a rock. It's not going to turn into a monkey or a banana or a fruit tree. It's not. It's dead. And uh, life from above, Yahweh, is what gave us life. And so we are created in his image. Let's give him the honor due his name. He made us, not we ourselves. And so let's cease from being wise in our own eyes and submit ourselves, fear Yahweh, and depart from evil. You know, Scripture talks over and over and over again about you know, you, you hear the scripture, the fool said in his heart, there's no Elohim. Well, there's, there's one man who is in worse condition, at least one man who is in worse condition than a fool. There's a, yep, that, that's right. There's one person who's in a worse condition than a fool. Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. See, even a fool can stop his foolishness. He can turn away from his foolishness. But uh, someone who's wise in their own eyes, they're in worse condition because they, they don't see the need to turn away from anything. They're already wise in their own eyes. So they're in worse condition than a fool. That's pretty serious. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 16 says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So we want to associate with men that are humble. I've learned a lesson, brothers, in that area. I've um, associated with, with people in the past who had major major pride in their life and found myself in a world of trouble because I didn't thought maybe I could help them and rehabilitate them or so I don't know but you know don't be wise in your own conceit and associate with people who are humble so that you don't get tempted and drawn in by the the pridefulness and um, a lot of the debates for instance you see out there today were things nobody can prove one way or the other um, really it becomes all about not so much what is the truth it becomes who has the truth me or you and uh, and who's smart enough to figure all this out and that becomes really the topic of conversation sometimes in like discussion forum debates and chat room debates it's not what is truth it's I've got it and you don't and I'll prove to you I have it and uh, when when people debate and um, you know, let's, let's, it's not bad to have a discussion about a scripture, but let's not get caught up in you know who's the greatest, you know, who's the greatest, who's the wiser one, who's wise in their in their own conceit, sometimes becomes victorious. The humble one just walks away, and and the and the prideful one thinks he won the argument when really the other one didn't want to get involved in who's the greatest. So. We're not supposed to be that way. Yahweh, if Yahweh reveals something to us, then he gets the glory, right? Not us. He gets the glory. Uh, because we didn't deserve it, right? Um, we didn't deserve any revelation that, that we got. So if we exalt ourselves through that, then we're we definitely missing something there, aren't we? We want to exalt ourselves through that. We want to exalt Him through that. And uh, and even if uh, we think we have something, we think we have been revealed something, uh, don't be afraid to say, oh, you know, I could be wrong. Um, maybe I didn't understand properly. Maybe it isn't a revelation from Elohim. Maybe uh, the word right here, the scripture right here is showing I'm wrong, and so it must not have been Him. We can't be too prideful to acknowledge that either. Because um, a lot of times, a lot of our troubles as men and, and women come 
when we choose to add to Yahweh's word something that doesn't exist. And so it says, Proverbs 30, verse 5, Every word of Elohim is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. And uh, sometimes we, we get these revelations, these ideas, and they're not really in Scripture, but we think, oh, this is a revelation. And, and uh, we may find ourselves adding to his words, and then Yahweh has to correct us later. So, now if our thoughts are not, our, you know, our thoughts are always on ourselves, our own revelation, we get what I got revealed, this, that's me, 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 me. Our thoughts are really on ourselves, not really on Yahweh. Our own words, our own personal interpretations, we're actually more in danger of adding to his words because then our thoughts are not really, they're void of Yahweh. They're, we're not keeping him in our thoughts. Really, it's really about, oh, this greatest thing I can't wait to, to tell somebody else about so that I can exalt myself. See, little inner workings of nooks and crannies of pride find their way in. And uh, that's why Psalm 10, verse 3 says, The wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces Yahweh. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek Elohim. Elohim is in none of his thoughts. And that was a danger of the scribes and Pharisees. They are always fighting and arguing about, debating over what this is right and that's right. And Elohim wasn't really in their thoughts. It was more about who's the greatest. Who's right, not what's right. And so it's when Elohim is not in our thoughts that we uh, have a tendency to answer sin's knock on our door. It's when Elohim is not in our thoughts that thoughts of self tend to dominate, don't they? Well, if we're so great on our own eyes, then how, do we, how can we receive the meekness of wisdom? How can we receive the wisdom that's from above, which is first pure, peaceful, gentle, willing to yield? Without partiality, without hypocrisy. Will Yahweh show us his truth? I think we have to be out of the way. We have to be out of the way. Out of the way of his glory. In order for us to truly be used by him the way he wants to use us. I mean, he could just wipe us like a dish. I mean, if I... Brothers, listen. If, if I, you know, start exalting myself on this webcast or... In my life, the way I live, um, and I start getting the glory instead of Yahweh getting the glory and His Word getting the glory, uh, Yahweh come along and just wipe me like a dish, and and I would rather Him get the glory. <laughs> I don't feel like being wiped like a dish. I don't know about you, but uh, I'd rather be used by Him and He get the glory. So, if I if I share a word if it encourages you and blesses you. Uh, I just say, you know, blessed be Yahweh, because he's the one that, that does it, if it's done. If anything is good at all, to him be the glory. Because I don't want to be in his way. And uh, if we are in his way, he can take us out of the way. So Yahweh, help us. Come now, you who say. Well, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to such and such a city. Well, we'll spend a year there, you know, buy and sell, make a profit, and... Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Even that is boasting. Instead, you ought to say, If Yahweh wills, we will live, and we'll do this or that. But now, you boast in your arrogance. See, there's a pride. Even boast, you see pride in this? Just to say, you know, I think... We're going to go to this city for a year and and then buy and sell and, and and make some profit, make some money over there. Wait a minute. You're talking about the future as though you know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't even know you don't even know if you'll live tomorrow. Your life is just this little mist that flies up and then you're gone. Your your history. Your time has come, your time is gone. You Instead, you say if Yahweh wills, we shall live. Yahweh wills, we'll have breath of life in us, 
and um, and then we will do this or we will do that. Give me a minute. So our life is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. That's what our life is. So it's prideful to say that we're going to do something tomorrow for your benefit when Yahweh holds the breath of life in his hands. Um, and, and you may be boasting of something that will never come because we assume too much for ourselves. Even in what maybe some of we, we, we read this and we think, what's the big deal? But uh, we see here he says it's evil. It's boast is evil to boast like that. Why? Because there's no pride, there's no humility in that. It's prideful. It's arrogant. As if you're the one that is the the uh, decider of whether you even live tomorrow. So it's by his mercies that we are not consumed. It is by his mercies that we live and we breathe and we have our being, isn't it? Hallelujah. So in everything that we do, brothers, we want to do it for Yahweh. He's the one that we seek to please. He's the one deserving of our attention. Our efforts to please Him will yield eternal rewards. Our efforts to please men will perish when they perish. So, sorry, my sound got a little bit low there, didn't it? Um, let's see if I fixed it. All right, so I don't know, it seems to drop out for some reason. I don't know, understand why, but having a little trouble with the uh, microphone lately. So er, our efforts to please men are actually, they're not really efforts to please men. Do you know that? Our efforts to please men are not really efforts to please men. Our efforts to please men, rather than Yahweh, are actually efforts to please ourselves. You know, if we can do things that please others, the self can be exalted, then you can feel like you're worth something, and that's all vanity. Let's use our gifts for the glory of Yahweh. Let's use our gifts to magnify His name. And when He blesses us with something, let's use it to advance the things that we need to, go, to move forward in the spiritual realm. So, you know, and when you do that, He will want to bless you even more. And we use our blessings to serve others, to edify others, to bless others. He'll want to bless us even more. And it's okay to please others. It's okay to, to please man to some degree um, with the perspective that it's Yahweh we are seeking ultimately to please. And... Um, and not one at the expense of the other. You don't want to please man and then displease Yahweh. You don't want to displease Yahweh through our pleasing of men. So, um, for instance, um, sometimes it's easy that, um, you know, for instance, musicians uh, come up before a congregation and uh, and sing and um and seek the, the praise of men. And the praise of men is really the focus of what they're trying to do and not the praise of Elohim. Then, you know, singing a song or playing an instrument well or, or whatever, you see this in some worldly musicians. Um, fancy lights, you know, the big stages and the smoke-filled stage is high and lifted up in the colored lights and everything coming down everything's there to glorify the singers and the band and the people you know they raise their hands to them and, and worship them and they're adored by the masses and um and we we see the same thing in christian contemporary music imagine imagine if uh you come to the feast of tabernacles in eminence missouri and i set this big stage up and uh lights and smoke and everything and and then some announcer come out and says and here's Elia and he comes out of the stage out of the smoke and give a sermon 
everyone would say, wow, that's what's he trying to do? Exalt himself? I mean, he would be so prideful to do that. And yet, when people do that with the guitars in their hand and sing a song, that's all normal. Why is that? Because that's what the world does. But do we see the prideful and arrogance of that? You know, they call themselves guitar heroes. Uh, what's so heroic about playing a guitar? <laughs> Did anybody, anybody's life get saved? I mean, what happened? Someone uh, die for someone else's life? or what? There's nothing heroic about it. You're playing an instrument. But they're called guitar heroes because they're getting glorified by men. And uh, and so we don't want we don't want to be gloating in our gifts, um, whether it's a quality of voice or be ashamed um, in anything that we do for Yahweh. It's Yahweh who gives us gives us the abilities that we have, and um, and even if we don't have the gift of music or singing, that doesn't mean we can't sing to Him with all of our hearts, because really. It's not the, uh, it's a make a joyful noise, right? So just making a noise, at least it's from the heart. We had people come to our feast years ago. They were deaf and um, they couldn't hear themselves singing. They were singing and uh, you know, it didn't sound the greatest, you know, as far as musically. Um, but in Yahweh's eyes, I know it was precious. And that's what really matters. Um or, you know, if you're going to write a study for other people um, to listen to, or a book, or a posting to a discussion forum, or a contribution in a chat room, or uh, we got to be careful that we're not doing this for the purposes to be seen by men. Our, our goal is to be seen by Elohim. And, and I, we see this in conversations, is who the, who's the greatest thing? But you know when we <clears throat> we need to understand that it's Yahweh that we're working for here. It's Yahweh that we're doing all these things for. He's the King. He's in first place, and He's already there. I mean, we we just have to live our lives in recognition that He is first, and He is the ultimate, hum, uh, ultimate, ultimate King, and we have to humble ourselves. He says, I am Yahweh, that is my name. My glory I will not give to another. My glory I will not give to another. It's his glory. Another place says, um, whatever you do, Colossians 3.23, do it heartily as to Yahweh and not to men, knowing that from Yahweh you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Master and Messiah. So we're not out for uh, man pleasing and, and eye service and uh, with singleness of heart we're looking for uh, the plea for Yahweh to be pleased with our conduct. That's our our intent and our goal and our hope, right? And whatever we do. So whatever we do, do it as unto Yahweh. When we get that frame of mind for everything that we do. Um, that we're doing it for Yahweh, and then when the sin comes knocking on our door, we're so accustomed to doing everything we're supposed to do for Yahweh that we're going to be a whole lot stronger and just say, no, I'm not working for that king over there, the God of this world. I'm working for Yahweh, the, the true Elohim. And uh, we become aware of his presence when we're focused on daily doing things to glorify him rather than doing things to serve ourselves, to make ourself, make our own life better, make our own uh, standing better. You know, our goal was ultimately to glorify Him, glorify Yahweh. I mean, look at David. Look at David. He fought. He was a fighter. He was a highly exalted man at, at what he was about to do. But, um, he just said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. I come to you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of the army of, of Israel, whom you have defied. He boasted in Yahweh. 
Everyone else was looking at the flesh. Look at the size of that man. How could anybody beat him in battle? David saw beyond the flesh. David was small in the eyes of the people, the people around him. Even his own brothers were mocking him. Oh, you left the sheep you're supposed to be caring for. What are you doing here? I know the pride of your heart. Wrong. David had the right perspective. His eyes weren't on man, please. His eyes were not really on what men would do or did not do. His eyes were on Yahweh. And Yahweh often will. He'll take someone who is small in the eyes of men and do awesome things with them. So his name will be honored rather than the man being honored. And think, you think about scripture, humble beginnings of Yahshua, born in a stall of farm animals. The humble prayer of Hannah. The humble beginnings of Saul the king, hiding among the equipment. To accept, too to meek to even accept being a king. They had to go find him. Um, you know, they, all, they all gathered, you know, proclaiming him the king. Here we go. And he was hiding. And then he got prideful. Making monuments for himself in First Samuel 15. And not acknowledging who really is the king. And then, of course, Moshe, the meekest man on the face of the earth. We see that in Numbers 12.3. The man Moshe was very humble. More than all men who were on the face of the earth. Here we are, the hum most humble man on the face of the earth. That's what it was going to take, brothers, for Yahweh to do an awesome work in him. He needed to find a meek and humble man because he's going to do great things to him. If we want to be used by Yahweh, then meekness and humility have to be one of the first things on the, on the agenda for us, right? And remain little in our own sight because once he begins to use us, we want to not be exalting ourselves. And... Um, and Saul even was told by Saul was told by Yahweh, when you were small in your own sight, weren't you made the king of Israel? And and but when he was no longer little in his own sight, Yahweh wiped him out like a man wipes a dish. We can't be in Yahweh's way of getting glory. In Acts chapter twelve, verse twenty one, these people from Tyre and Sidon come down, they wanted to be fed their bellies, you know. And they want to be friendly terms of Herod. So, the set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, The voice of an Elohim, not of a man. Then immediately the angel of Yahweh struck him because he did not give glory to Elohim. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of Elohim grew and multiplied. See? Here's Herod. People say, oh, here, here's the voice of an Elohim. And because he didn't give glory to Yahweh, that was the end of him. And what happened? Instead of Herod growing, the word of Elohim grew, right? Instead of Herod being exalted, Yahweh's word got exalted. So in the good things he did speak, he needed to give glory to Yahweh. Uh, I don't know what's happening here. It looks like our audio is back up again. So, um, what does Yahweh really require of us? He's shown you, O oh man, what is what is good, Michael six eight, and what does Yahweh require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy. And walk humbly with your Elohim. Very interesting. Because there's three basic things. Walk in righteousness. Be merciful toward those who don't walk in righteousness. And stay humble. We can stay humble. That's it. First we walk in, in righteousness. Then we have mercy on others. And stay. Those three things are the basic requirements of all of us. Sums it up right there, doesn't it? The whole Bible right there is summed up. And uh, another place. 
Isaiah 66, verse 1, thus says Yahweh, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand is made, and all those things exist, says Yahweh. But on this one I will, will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Do we do that? We, do we tremble at his word? I mean, it means when we hear his word, we're thinking about ourselves, our own lack, our own failures, our own weaknesses, our own struggles, and we recognize our need to change. That's what we do when we hear his word. Or we're looking for, oh, yeah, that, that really applies to so-and-so. They really need to hear that one, you know. Maybe we read his word looking for things to show others we're right so we can get glory. How about that one? May we read his word looking for things that convict our hearts. Maybe that's a little better, isn't it? It's better than reading the word looking for things to glorify self and make self look like, oh, we know everything about the Bible. You don't have to look very far in a chat room or discussion forum to see that very thing going on a lot of times. And it's when a conversation changes from what's right to who's right, it all goes downhill from there. You know, we're having discussions of Scripture, and it's all about the truth, and that's great. And then get into this personal thing. Oh, who has it? Oh, no, here it comes. Pride comes in. Work of the flesh came in, and it muddied up the whole thing. You know, it's, it's good to share the Word, brothers. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's good to share the Word, but it's when it, it convicted us first, you know. It, it really has the power. It's when it convicted us first and and when it, it spoke to us and we recognized it. And pride, um, you'll hear this sometimes even in conversations between, especially men. Okay, men, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. Um, conversations between men, you know, uh, see it at workforce out there, you know, you see it. Um, different gatherings of believers, even uh, congregations, and comes through the conversation. There's this uh, one man will tell some story, you know, that, that really serves to exalt himself. Well, I just did this, and, and then somebody else will tell another story that exalts himself, and then somebody is this little undercurrent of, okay, I I deserve respect, you know, I did this, this is what I'm about, you know. Uh, and you see that, and you hear it, and if we're sensitive to recognizing where pride is rearing its ugly head, then then we'll hear these things sometimes, and sometimes it'll it'll degrade even for, even worse to to uh, telling stories about how bad other people are, and then of course you're suggesting by that you're not that way, right? You know, uh, and by that you know, exalting yourself by putting others down, you know. I, I, I know there, there are people out there, I'm sure you've met them, right? Couldn't be you, couldn't be me, of course, right? <laughs> that uh, part of their personality was putting others down, so they might appear to be better and be wiser. Uh, they might make up even false accusations about others, uh, so as to appear to be distant from such things. And, um, and, you know, we see someone always speaking evil of others, but then they speak well of you, of course, right? Uh, or they say nothing about you. They, they, that trend will continue when you're not around. You know, they'll be talking about you also. See, and um, and they're all they they feel insecure, and so they feel this need to exalt themselves so that others will not reject them, and that's really the root of it. They don't want to feel rejection of men. Um, and scripture warns us about associating yourselves with slanderers, with men that gossip, and women that gossip, uh, sharing stories about other people that uh, reflect on other people negatively. Um, all these things, a lot of times, are rooted in pride. And Yahweh doesn't like it. He doesn't like talebearing. He says, you shall not go up and down as a talebearer among your people. Um, and so... Let's be aware of these things. Is there anything in our heart that sort of 
you know, eases our conscience a little bit, you know, toward our own struggles when we start telling stories about how bad others are. And uh, that's it. Well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy, right? If there's a neighborhood of uh, 14 houses and um, 13 of them, uh, those people are murderers. There's one guy there he's never murdered and we must think himself to be something great. And Yahweh looks at him and says, no, you you don't have murdered, but you've stolen, you committed adultery, you did this. And all the while he thinks taking comfort and solace in the fact he's not a murderer. And uh, we don't compare ourselves with ourselves. That's not where it's at. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. We don't compare ourselves with ourselves. That's where pride comes in. Oh, look at me compared to you. See, I'm this, you're not. You're not that, and I am. And, and what we need to do is compare ourselves to the true, the true, true example. Continually recomparing ourselves to Yahushua HaMashiach. Because he's the only one really worthy of that position. Um, and if you feel, I'm not saying it's wrong, brothers, to when you see a good example of, of someone in your uh, in your life that you see is Messiah-like, free to look at that and say, "Yeah, I need to emulate that." But it's Messiah in them that you're wanting to emulate. We get caught up in this. Okay, okay, I feel like I'm I can belong in this group because uh, I feel like you know in this particular group I'm not going to be put down or look and I can handle this group. Well, this group over here, oh, they're all prideful people, you know. They're all arrogant and really they're not. It's just that you're when you're with them, you're feeling like, you know, you don't belong because you're not arrived at their level of character yet. So <clears throat> it's better to associate with those who you view as being much of higher degree than you are, so that you can learn the Messiah-like character that they exhibit. Um, it reminded me of of a story one time. I used to work in the heating and air conditioning trade and. It seemed like every company had its main guy who was like the best technician of all of them, you know. And and uh, one day I I had to I had to leave the company because I wouldn't get enough hours. And he says, "Well, go find a company where you're the best guy in. See, <laughs> then you get paid well and everybody will like you, because that's what he was doing." And it's no different. And people join churches. This denomination, because oh, I feel like I can belong here, you know, uh, and they don't challenge themselves. So let's be aware of pridefulness in these areas. You know, pride's also uh, a source of anger. Well, if we're angry at another person, um, there was some wrong that they have done to themselves, to, to us, to somebody else, they've done this wrong thing, are we mindful of the fact that, you know, we've done wrong things in our lives, too. And do we really deserve to be so, so angry at that other person for what they're doing wrong when we ourselves have been guilty in our life of doing the same thing? That pridefulness. See how that just finds its way in there? And it's, you know, it's hidden right there, a little spot in the heart, and just kind of waiting to manifest itself. And uh, anger, a lot of times, almost every time, anger is out of, is really out of pride. Because who do we have? What right do we have to be so angry? We're committing other sin, maybe not the same as them. You know, we sinned yesterday over this, and we're mad at somebody else because they sinned over this other area. Be mad at yourself. You know, um, it, don't be angry at others. It's not going to do you any good anyway. We think through our anger, we can. We can make somebody righteous. You think so? You think we can make somebody else right? We get mad at them and intimidate them. They'll change, right? Oh, we might change their external conduct. We don't change the heart because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of Elohim. I don't care if they're your children or another man. Hard lesson for me. 
don't let anger take root in you, in your household. Uh, so, you know, pride causes arguments and strife. And Scripture talks about he who is of a proud heart stirs up strife. He who trusts in Yahweh will be prospered. Let's not stir up the strife. Let's be of humble hearts. An angry man stirs up strife. See, pride and anger are related to one another. Proud heart stirring up strife. Angry man stirring up strife. A furious man abounding in transgression. A prideful heart is the root of rebellious children. And, re and in wives also who rebel against the head of the household. A child who thinks he's worthy to argue with an adult needs to learn a lesson in humility. Leviticus 19.3 says, Every one of you shall revere his father and his mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. I'm Yahweh your Elohim. So, there's a pridefulness and a lack of proper reverence and respect toward one who is in authority in our life. Could be a boss at work. Yahweh has allowed that person. It could be a, a, a leader of a nation or a or someone in political authority, or, or whatever. Um, and so we want to show proper reverence toward those who are in, in authority. And um, and then the husband, who acts like he's the god of the house, you know. He's Elohim in the house, you know, because he's got the authority. He, you know, he needs to learn a lesson from Yahshua, because Yahshua didn't sit back and just fire off commandments and, no, he earned the respect of others through a servant leadership. And it's easier, even natural, to follow someone who's spending their time serving you, you know, than it's hard it's harder to follow someone who only serves himself. And so a wife who thinks she's in a position to fight and argue and against her husband, she needs to read what Yahweh thinks about that. If a man is working to supply food and shelter for the family. He is serving the family. Now he's doing the bare minimum of what it takes to not be called an infidel, but he's serving the family. And uh, a wife should honor that and not exalt herself to act like the head of household and try to overthrow her husband's headship. It's all about humility. And none of us should ever think of ourselves as being in a higher place or higher position than we're actually in. Remember the Garden of Eden? That's what Satan tempted Eve with. Oh, you can be just like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And that was the mistake. And that gets repeated one generation to another. Satan pulled the same deception every year. Every new generation comes along, and both men and women fall for it. And so let's not think of ourselves as being more highly or place ourselves in a higher position than we're actually in. And Yahshua talked about this in Luke 14. He says when you're invited to a wedding feast, uh, go sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you shall have glory in the presence of those that sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled he who humbles himself will be exalted. There it is again. How many times I have seen this in my life. That saying right there. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be It is such an awesome saying in this little verse here. But so, 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 so many times I see this happening. And you know, our seating arrangements are not so important in our culture today. But thought about this, you know, another application might be, you know, let's say that there are, you know, 15 people in a room having a conversation and and one person is just dominating everything, everything he says. He's always talking. He's dominating the whole conversation and very few other people can really get a word in. It's no different than sitting in the highest place. See, it really is no different. Um, my words are more important than everybody else's words, and so I'm going to talk, 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 and no one else will ever be able to say anything because what I say is the most important thing. And um, 
And so do we do that? Do we seek to be the center of attention? Now there's a time when Yahshua gave sermons. Yes, there's a time to, to give somebody a, a hearing and what they have to say and then let other people talk as well. But you know, it's, it's sometimes the desire to be accepted and other people to like you and to be, to be glorified by men is accomplished with the tongue to be, to be one who's respected. But, and then the ones who are just sitting there quietly at the table, someone might look over and say, hey, what do you think about this? You're awful quiet over there. <laughs> I think it was George Washington. He was a uh, this big thing. I don't know if the signing of the Declaration of Independence or what it was, and and all these people were there, and and George was probably the most honored man there, and yet he was saying almost nothing. And someone come up to him and says, "George, why aren't you talking?" He says, "Well, when I talk, I like people to listen." <laughs> so you know, that's it. There are certain ones who are more dominant or a conversation, or whatever it might be, and be careful if there's a time to speak, a time to not speak, and so on, that we are not being motivated by pride and seeking the glory of men. I mean, what kept the Pharisees and scribes and rulers from accepting the Messiah? There it was, pride. When Yahshua came to Peter, Peter's like, oh, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And yet he was chosen to be a major leader in the assembly of the first century. The other men, rulers of the synagogues, many of the rulers of the synagogues even believed in him, John 12, 42. But because of the Pharisees, he did not confess him. They were afraid that he'd be put out of the synagogue. Why? They loved the praise of men more than the praise of Elohim. They didn't want to be humbled and ashamed and be kicked out of the synagogue you know that may be one major reason right there why people who attend various churches will not accept the truth of Sabbath keeping calling on Yahweh's name Yahshua's name keeping feast days eating clean foods keeping Torah why they don't want to be cast out of their church because they love the praise of men more than the praise of Elohim it's pride same problem, different century. Same thing was going on back then is going on today. And uh, if it's something that's going to cause you to be looked down upon by others when you start doing something different, everybody individually, all of us individually, I, you, everyone has to face the question. Am I refusing to do this thing I see in the scripture because I'm afraid of what people will say about me? I'm afraid of what my wife will say about me, my husband will say about me, my children, my my father, my mother, my my grandfather, my friends, my neighbors, what will they say about me? That has absolutely no factor whatsoever in what truth is or is not. None. Cuz what they say about you ain't going to matter on judgment day. I mean, they're not going to be all crowd around you on Judgment Day. Well, I think he was a nice man. He should be He should be deserved to go in. Let him in the kingdom. Go ahead. Let him in, Yahweh. All right. Yahweh says, since all these people said you sure, you're a good guy, I'll let you go in. Some people, that's the way they think, and it's not true. <laughs> it's not the way they think. It's not thinking, look, we got to put Yahweh first. We've got to put Yahweh first. It doesn't matter what people think or say or do. And that was a danger right here. Loving the praise of men more than the praise of Elohim. Yahweh help us. We, and we want Yahweh to give us these revelations and his understandings and help us hear his word. And, and, um, and yet we, we shoot ourselves in the foot when we want the praise of men. We don't accept things because we don't, we don't want to be looked down upon by others. And do, we, do we assume even in what we have found, that because we found something, that we're, we're better than another person who hasn't found that yet. Do we consider our, uh, one another to be better than ourselves, as Scripture tells us to do? You know, most people you can learn something from. I, I uh, spoke with my father this morning on the 
telephone. And this particular teacher on the t on the TV he says about you know 39 wheelbarrows of of things you don't want to listen to, and one wheelbarrow of something that's really good. And uh, and that's and and from the one wheelbarrow of good, okay, you learn the good. So uh, and and so we can never be sort of this never have this attitude where I can't learn from that person because they don't have this particular truth over here and uh, we want to be careful we're not deceived by the 39 other wheelbarrows but um, at the same time not be so prideful and say well I can't learn from this person because this other thing over here they've got wrong you know uh, I've learned a lot about myself just from observing my own children you ever, you ever notice that you know hey son you need to not be uh doing what i do <laughs> right or or children don't uh and this yahweh is in your mind going you do that you do that right you, you ever had that one i'm sure you have oh come on brother david you've had that right uh-huh <laughs> okay i've had that too i know we've had that conversation before so all of us, brothers, we can learn even from others' mistakes. We can learn from others' good examples. We can learn from our own children. And uh, especially when they get older in their teenage years, you ask your children, what do I need to improve? Don't be too prideful, and actually they'll respect you more. Right? And Because if anyone thinks he knows anything, I, I know a guy who was very, very learned. I mean, he... He knew Hebrews, Hebrew backwards and forwards, and he could read it fluently and understand it easily, and he studied all these subjects. Very quick mind, very high IQ. And yet he used to always say, I know a lot. I know a lot. I thought, well, why do you say that? I didn't, I didn't really rebuke. Maybe I should have. He used to say that all the time, and I, I thought, Later, and I realized the scripture um, that come to mind about that. It says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. <laughs> but if anyone loves Elohim, this one is known by him. And so it's not about what you know, it's about who knows you. And so in the end, I hope it's not just raw knowledge that Yahweh judges us by, but it's about what we do with what we have that he judges us by, to whom much is given, much is required. And so it's what we do with what we have, and sometimes we have more than we think we do. And we say, oh, I don't know that. I didn't know. Well, you should have known. Should have known better. Should have sought it out. Other times, we think we know something, we don't know anything yet. Um, you also see pride in, in prayers sometimes. Sometimes you hear this on the radio, people praying, you know. First they're, they're talking to, to the Heavenly Father, and then after a time they stop talking to the Heavenly Father, they start talking to the congregation. In other words, it's no longer really a prayer. Yahweh is no longer in the first person here. He's now talking about Yahweh rather than to Yahweh. And um, who's he really praying to? You know, and so... Prayer is not a performance, it's an offering. It's a holy offering without blemish to Yahweh. That's what it's supposed to be. And a sweet incense. And when we're praying, we're speaking to Him. Uh, you might talk about Him as you're speaking to Him. You might declare His worthiness in His awesome ways. But just remember the prayer of the two men. Luke 18, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed with who? Thus with himself. Self-motivated prayer. Elohim, I thank you. I'm not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. He's bragging on himself. The tax collector standing afar off was not so much as raised his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast. Elohim, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There you go again. Powerful, powerful statement. Yahshua repeated that principle many times. He spoke about the need to be like children who are humble and are willing to follow. He gave illustrations and examples of where pride rears its ugly head. we got to get pride out of our prayers. Use prayers as a time to humble ourselves before Yahweh. The Pharisee was not doing that. He was exalting himself before Yahweh. And if our prayer is not really a prayer, but it's a performance, then we're just exalting ourselves before Yahweh. We aren't any different. So we don't want to pray in pretense and make long prayers as to be seen among men. And when we pray, our prayers need to be there for the purposes of exalting Yahweh, not the purposes of causing others to be impressed with our prayers. Let's be humble confessors more so than eloquent professors that are greater in Yahweh's eyes. You know, even the, the uh, humble professor was justified. Humble confessor was, ju was justified. So we don't need Yahweh resisting us. Doesn't he resist the proud and give grace to the humble? Last thing we need in our life, brothers, let me tell you right now. You don't need Yahweh resisting you. Speaking to myself. Looking at myself here in the... <laughs> so very important. Another area of pride. I will not forgive that person. I will not... They, they have done it the last time. I will not forgive them ever again. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6, 14, 15. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses... Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Whoa. For so prideful, not be willing to forgive. Wait a minute. You got some sin in your own life. Either now or maybe some point later. Maybe even worse than what you're judging them for. We've all received forgiveness. We hope so. The truth is we won't unless we're willing to forgive others. We have to be willing to forgive. If we, heed, we need to heed that warning because all things hidden will come to light. For harboring unforgiveness toward another, a lot of times our own pride causes us to forget. Oh, we've got our own sins to deal with. We need Yahweh's mercy. We needed Yahweh's mercy in the past for some similar thing we were involved in. And or maybe in the future, we might need Yahweh's mercy we're getting caught up in the very same thing. We've been so judgmental and harsh and, and, and bitter and angry as somebody else about. See, pride finds its ways and its way into all kinds of areas. Here's another one. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For Elohim resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of Elohim, that he may exalt him, exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, because he cares for you. Um, I think this is an area where our generation really fails. And that is honoring the elders. Honoring the elderly. You know, I think one reason for that is we we know that the elderly are not so hip on the latest and greatest gener you know technologies and and things, and, and maybe that's why they're not people view them as being out of touch and uh, and, and foolish when it comes to can't even use a, a little PDA or a, or a smartphone. You know, they need you know, and so it and so people look at them and say, oh well, they don't know anything. You know, they live long enough to earn and learn some wisdom that us younger people need, and we need to honor and respect them And because it's not how well you use a computer or a laptop or a smartphone that's going to help your spiritual walk. It's, it's how well you've developed your character. And people who are older, who have been people who've sought righteous character, are probably more developed than you are. In many cases 
And, uh, and so we need to honor and respect them, even if they don't deserve it. It's their position. They're older than you. And uh, young people are not taught respect. And I, I know myself, I have areas I have to learn in this. And uh, I wasn't, you know, I didn't always do this as a young person. And, um, and you know, people mock them and shove them away in some nursing home somewhere where they don't have to listen to them. And, and uh, you know, Hollywood spends millions and billions of dollars glorifying and honoring the youth. you got to be young looking. That's the goal. Got to look young. That's, that's everybody's focus. Yeah, Yahweh says, You shall rise before the gray-headed. Honor the presence of the old man. And fear your Elohim. I am Yahweh. Just the opposite. So a part of fearing Elohim is to honor the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man. That's part of fearing Elohim. If you are failing in this, you're not fearing Elohim. That's just... They go hand in hand. Some people, yes, maybe they're all, they're older, but they're not worthy of honor. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So it says the silver haired the silver haired head is a crown of glory if it's found in the in the way of righteousness. Uh, you know, we need to honor those who are older. Sometimes they're older; they don't act very honorably, it causes some people to dishonor them. But in the same way, a uh, child should honor their parents, whether they're acting honorably or not honorably, because of the office they hold. The policeman comes by, pulls you over, you're going to start ripping him, or are you going to show him respect? Not because he's not a hypocrite, not because he's perfect in his own law, keeping and whatever, but because he's in the position of a, an authority in the land, you show them proper respect. And so Yahweh puts the older people uh, as the ones that teach the younger. And, uh, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So respect the age if you can't respect the, the uh, behavior. But um, anyway, before I, I close, I want to I point something out. There's a different kind of pride, a different kind of glorying that's, that's actually, it's okay to be in, in this area. And that is this. I don't know if I'd call it pride. I'd call it glorying, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But Elohim has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. Elohim has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. You ever notice that? You know, some people in our walk, even, I, you know, a lot of people in our walk are struggling with character issues and stuff. You know, they've got some areas that, you know, they're kind of fleshly maybe, and um, and uh, maybe not very considered very uh, valuable in the eyes of the world or whatever. And yet they find their their identity here. And uh, and so we sometimes we like the Corinthian assembly. You know, we have our problems, don't we? The assembly in Corinth there, we read uh, Paul writing to the first Corinthians, they had a lot of problems. So we have our problems sometimes. He's not picking out the, the he's looking for the, you know, going the highways and byways and looking for the lame, the blind, the ones that are, you know, struggled in their life. And the base things of the world, the things which are despised, Elohim's chosen, the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Not many wise after the flesh are called. Not many very noble people are called. Yahweh chooses the ones considered foolish so that no one will glory in his Just for the sake that no one will glory in his presence. The condition of our mind in regards to how we as Yahweh's people are willing to conduct ourselves has a lot to do with whether Yahweh even chooses us. But of him you are in Messiah Yahshua, who became for us wisdom from Elohim, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in Yahweh. What does that mean, the glory in Yahweh? Well, he's quoting from 
Jeremiah 9.23 says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man in his might glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these... I delight. So Yahweh delights when we glory in the fact that He is Elohim. We know Him. We understand He is Yahweh. He exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness. And we justify Him and we glory in Him. Now don't confuse this with self-righteousness. It's easy to do that. But don't be ashamed. Rather, glory. Glory in the things that Yahweh is having you do. Glory in the fact that others are putting you down and mocking you because of your obedience to the Father. Glory in that. And a lot of times the reason, as we said earlier, people are afraid to do it because of the, the fear of men. But rejoice that the works of Yahshua are seen in you. Because we you know, we go through town, we may look a little different, you know, we're, we're dressed more modestly than most of the world. We don't try to exalt ourselves or the way our body looks with our clothing. We might have these tassels, you know, hanging off our shirts and, and things. And um, men might have a beard or, or men, women might be covering their heads or whatever. We neither exalt ourselves nor hang our heads in shame. We don't have to walk around in shame for these things. We can walk around and rejoice in glory in it, not being self-righteous type of glory but knowing this is the right way this is the way of Messiah and this is the right way and I take my glory from Yahweh in that and I rejoice in that that we that I'm doing that he has given me the ability and understanding to do this and not I'm not ashamed of it in fact I, I rejoice in it I feel blessed by it these are the things Yahweh's taught us. We don't have to be ashamed of it. This is a righteous way of conduct. We honor Yahweh with our bodies, the way Yahweh made us, provoking the spiritual nature in people rather than the fleshly passions through the way we dress. We're very blessed to be his servants. All the long suffering and mercy and love he had for us to teach us the things that we have learned so that we would be his own, so he would have forgiven us of so much. Things we've done wrong, and we're very blessed to be called his servants, to be called children of the king. Yahshua paid the ultimate price so that I could be his, one of his children. And so when we do what's commanded of us, we rejoice in it. But at the same time, we don't brag about it, we don't exalt ourselves, we, we wait on Yahweh. And the scripture says, Which of you having a servant or plow, plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's come in from the field, Come what once, sit down to eat? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk, then afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things that are commanded, say this, say we are unprofitable servants. We've done what was our duty to do. So many times we hear, oh, so-and-so down the road, he did this wrong thing over here. I would not do that. So-and-so did this over here. I would not have done that. Comparing yourselves with others. Don't lose your reward. Stuck. You did something right. Oh, I did my duty to do. No big deal. I don't, I'm not proud of it. Yahweh gave me the strength to do it. But I'm not ashamed of it either. So don't lose your reward. Don't waste your life on vanity and the glory of men. Exalt Yahweh, who is worthy of praise. Not unto us, O Yahweh, not unto us. But to your name give glory because of your mercy and because of your truth. Because he showed us his truth and he showed us the mercy that we needed to be redeemed from the areas where we failed to walk in that truth. And so let's just praise Yahweh for everything we have. Let's glorify him in that we, while we were sinners, Yahshua died for us. You know, just praising him and honoring him from the heart is an act of humility. Some people are feel too ashamed to say, Oh, praise Yahweh! Too ashamed to even say that. 
But scripture says, my soul shall make its boast in Yahweh. And the humble will hear it, and they'll be glad. They'll be glad to hear that, boasting in Yahweh. Because they're humble too. And yeah, that's right. Praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. They know he's worthy of glory. The humble hear it, and they rejoice that you boast in him. Even Yahshua desired. Yahweh's name be glorified. Father, he said, John 12, 28, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. So let's say it, brothers, you and I together, all of us, sisters, on the count of three, Father, one, two, three, Father, glorify your name. Hallelujah. And let's be sure that our lives are of such that he does receive glory and not ourselves. In the end, everyone that's high and lofty will be brought low. And so let's conduct ourselves in such a way that we won't need to be humbled that final day. Let it be we set aside all pride now rather than having Yahweh humble us later. For the day is coming, behold, the day is coming. Malachi 4.1 Burning like an oven and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says Yahweh of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Isaiah 2.17 The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. All these people run around in their little cars, and they're thinking they look all hot to trot, and their fancy clothes, and their proud countenances, and their tough man looks, and their whatever they are. None of that stuff is going to be exalted. Yahweh will be exalted, and such men will be humbled. The idols he will utterly abolish. They shall go in the holes of the rocks and in the caves of the earth from the terror of Yahweh and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold which they have made, each one himself for himself to worship. To the moles and the bats that go to the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks from the terror of Yahweh and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Sever yourself from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils. For what account is he? No, associate with the humble, right? Yahweh says, Isaiah 13, 9, Behold, the day of Yahweh comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. Look around you. It'll be desolate. He will destroy the sinners from it, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Even that will be humbled. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for, its, for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more, more rare than fine gold a man more than a golden wedge of Ophir. I will shake the heavens, therefore, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of Yahweh of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Zephaniah 3, eight. Therefore wait for me, says Yahweh, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger, all the... Earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. He's jealous. He alone's worthy of praise. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of Yahweh. See, now people don't do that. One day they will. Why don't we do it now? How about that? <laughs> to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Many of us talk about the day of Yahweh when Yahshua returns and look forward to his return. But brothers, if we've got pride in our hearts, we'll have to be one of those humbled. 
Let's get it out. Let's get it out now. Let's be the meek and humble people that's left in the midst. The ones who are, quote, left behind are the meek and the humble. That's the post-trib rapture, right? Okay. Knowing our place, not exalting ourselves more highly than we ought, and being content right where we are, because he's Elohim. We are his people, the people of his pasture, and we're the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So do we hear that voice calling us to humble ourselves rather than exalting ourselves? Because Yahweh alone is worthy of exaltation. Just as the four living creatures in Revelation, let's declare to everyone his holiness. The four living creatures, Revelation 4, 8, each one having six wings were full of eyes all around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Yahweh Elohim Almighty, who was and is and is to come. For if we exalt him, and we humble ourselves, Yahweh will exalt the humble with a crown of glory. And when we receive that crown of glory, brothers, even then, we may do what the 24 elders do in the next verses, it says, whenever living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O master, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. And with that saying, let's pray. Father Yahweh, You alone, Father, are worthy of glory. You alone, Father, are worthy of praise. And we praise You. And we thank You, Father, for calling us out of darkness into this awesome walk that we are not even worthy to be a part of. Thank you, Father, for digging us all from this pit we dug for ourselves and pulling us out of this miry pit, out of the clay, and forming us into the image of your dear Son. For your glory, Father. For your glory and your glory alone. Father, lead us to that everlasting river, that river of the water of life, that we might drink, that we might be partakers of eternal life through Yahshua HaMashiach. Shine a light, Father Yahweh, in the areas of our hearts that we have pride. Open our eyes to it. If you need to humble us, Father, humble us. Just open our eyes. We don't want to be displeasing in your sight. We want to glorify you. And the many ways you've served us, Father, we want to serve you. Thank you, Father. Yahshua's name, Amen. And brothers, let's never forget that pit from which we were dug. A pit which we dug for ourselves. Let's remain humble. No matter how far Yahweh takes us, no matter how many men may praise us, because Yahweh alone empowers us to do anything, if we accomplish anything. Let's purge any and all leavening of pride and maintain the humbleness Yahweh desires, that state of mind, so that we may not lose our reward, so that we may receive that crown of life through Yahshua HaMashiach, who is our worthy master and our king. May Yahweh bless you. And may Yahweh have mercy on us all.